Good Erev Shabbos, my friends. I'm sorry that I'm unable to join you this Shabbos, but I figured I'd leave you a short Dvar Torah, something to think about over Shabbos. The Torah, this week's Parsha, Parsha Bo, deals with the laws of the carbon Pesach, the Paschal Lamb, its intricacies. Among those halachos, the halacha that you're not allowed to eat the carbon Pesach any other way other than prepared, roasted. It's strange to talk about the carbon Pesach so early, months before Pesach, after all, the Gemara tells us that that 30 days prior to the holiday, you're supposed to start to study the laws of the Pesach, the laws of the carbon Pesach, and the laws of Chametz and Matzah. By most conservative standards, this would be far too advanced notice to start to talk about those laws. Certainly, we don't want anyone to start hyperventilating the law in the aisles of the supermarket and start thinking about Pesach even before Purim arrives. And yet, not only does our Parsha mention it at this point, but also the Daf Yomi has been studying the laws of Pesach and carbon Pesach for the last week or so, and we are knee-deep in those halachos. And so the unique confluence of the Daf Yomi's engagement in this law, as well as the Parsha, gives us the license, if not a legal license, the poetic license, to start to talk about the laws of the carbon Pesach. So the Pesach, the Torah tells us, don't prepare the carbon Pesach in any other way other than to roast it. We're not allowed to boil it. We're not allowed to microwave it. We're not allowed to fry it. We have to roast the carbon Pesach. And Rabbi Yehuda Nossi adds, not only do we not roast the carbon Pesach, we're not allowed to stew it in its own juices. So yes, you can't put it in a paste containing water and wine and other spices, but you can't take its own natural juices and boil it up in those juices. What's the problem with roasting, with stewing, a carbon Pesach in its own juices. I'd like to suggest that the carbon Pesach is the representation, is the mitzvah that represents emancipation, represents freedom. In a week like this, in which we had a transition of power from one presidential uh, term to a new president, and people are feeling patriotic and feeling the sense of freedom and knowing that the right to have a democracy through representation, to elect our own officials, we sense that that is the pinnacle of freedom, that that is the greatest expression of freedom that we know today. And it's true. But without dismissing that, I'd like to suggest that Karim Pesach represents a unique aspect of freedom that we often don't consider uh, to, be, to be treasured. After all, we're sitting in Egypt, and we haven't been released yet from our bondage. At that point, the Torah instructs us to offer the Karim Pesach. In other words, the most unique expression of freedom happens while we're still slaves. So what is the carbon Pesach and why does it express freedom in a way that no other institution and no other mitzvah can do so? I believe it's this halacha of Rebbe Huda Nasi. Don't allow the carbon Pesach to stew in its own juices. What does that mean? Perhaps freedom means not roasting in your own juices, not sitting around regurgitating old ideas, recycling old accomplishments and ambitions. Freedom demands thinking outside of the box. Freedom requires that we see the possibility beyond the confines of our current predicament. Because even if you are in the four walls of a prison, you can be free if you envision yourself outside of that box. Don't sit around and imagine the only thing you can accomplish is what's in front of you, are the juices that you've already experienced, that you've already sat in. Indeed, this is true on an intellectual level as well. The world of academic integrity requires that we don't just take someone else's material and plagiarize that, but we come up with our own material. But we go beyond that point. According to the American Psychological Association, there's an offense known as self-plagiarism. Self-plagiarism is where is the practice of taking the ideas and the previously published ideas that you have come up with and republishing them, reissuing them as if they were new. That also is a violation. That also is an ethical breach. Not only can't you copy someone else's material, which is obvious, but you can't take your old material and present it as if that's a new and fresh idea. Because a free man, a free person does not take their old ideas and present them again. Soloveitchik Zatzal was famous for delivering 
complex Talmudic discourses. One time the story is told that he was presenting an idea that he had presented previously in a previous iteration, a previous cycle, and a student raised his hand and, and said that the Rav had said something slightly different last year when he was presenting that concept. And the Rav chided him, the Rav yelled at him and said, never mind what I said then. I'm speaking to you now. And what I said last year is irrelevant. This is a new shear. It's a new concept. It's a new idea. We don't sit around and stew in our old creative juices. But beyond intellectual freedom, I think there's an important ethic that emerges from the carbon Pesach and this halacha of Rabbi Danasi. When it comes to emancipating ourselves from the past, we have to free ourselves from emotional and personal bondage. We all know people who are incapable of letting go of the past. They constantly repeat old stories. They play back the same events in their head. They can't let go of what happened or the slights that were, the, that were, that were issued against them. They're bound by old experiences and therefore they can't enjoy their current experiences because nothing will ever match the past. Nothing will ever match the heyday, the good old days, the Alterheim. We know people who can't let go of old grudges. They refuse to forgive. The only prize ideas they have and music and literature are things that stood the test of time in the past. But remember that meat stewing in its own juices or some other liquid, it might be delicious, but it evokes physical and emotional constriction. It's the notion of someone bottling up the feelings of ideas, things they deeply wish to communicate, but they have the inability to do so. And when it comes to regurgitating the old, it builds resentment, it causes anger to fester, and it will emerge later in an unpleasant and unproductive way. And so perhaps if we heed this crucial lesson of the carbon Pesa, we renew ourselves not to rely upon the old, not to be hindered by stagnant emotions and pain, then perhaps it's never too early to engage in the study of these laws of the carbon Pesach and derive new inspiration. Shabbat Shalom.